So last time I dealt with the first half of a sermon in which this guy, Kevin, basically prepped his audience to misunderstand and become belligerent toward non-believers. I'd suggest going back and watching at some point, but this video stands on its own, so it's up to you. Today we're going to watch the second part, in which Kevin lies about a conversation he had with me and a friend, in a formulaic, apologetic way you'll probably find familiar, before running through a few really basic apologetics and telling his congregation what they should think of anybody who isn't converted by those really basic apologetics. Keep an eye out for an amazing presentation by Jackson Wheat, who joined me to debunk a claim Kevin made about evolution. Anyway, let's do this. I'm an analytical brain kind of guy. All the analytical, figure it out, you process things and you figure out what makes sense and what doesn't. All you, you don't have to raise your hand, you know who you are. Well, this doesn't make sense, I can't do this, this is dumb. I mean, that doesn't add up at all. I mean, that, no, 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 no. And so in my, in my Gentile heritage, I guess you could say I would be on the side of saying, well, that's foolishness. Who believes in a man that died 2,000 years ago and supposedly rose again? Not me, that's for sure. And even if he did, why does that help me now? What, what, what is this? This thing you call the way. This belief, this new faith, this new covenant, this new testament. For the Gentiles, it bypasses knowledge, it bypasses philosophy, it bypasses science, which I really find ironic. Because God's the one that invested all, invented all of that. God is the one that invented math. Did you see him do it? Did anybody see him do it? Better yet, what would math not existing even look like? If God hadn't created it, would one object next to another object be something other than two objects? Would the structure and language we use to describe this reality cease to exist in our heads? By suggesting God needed to create math before we could discover it, Kevin seems to grossly misunderstand the nature of abstractions. All you math lovers, say amen. All you math lovers that don't love math, say amen anyway. Don't blame the algebra teacher. God made it up. He's the one that put it in order. He's the one that made that understanding and philosophies and science and all these different laws of the universe. He's the one that made them. It's really cool. It's pretty neat that we don't fall off the earth. Yeah, I'm fairly happy about it myself. I guess we found one thing to agree on. Right? Now, are you, are you glad that he started the thing spinning and said, that, that works? Aren't you glad he doesn't just out of fun, like I might want to do every now and then, just go, ooh, stop, ooh, no gravity. Everybody just starts to float. Wouldn't that be fun just for a split second? Oh, just kidding. I mean, that would be a fun day. Like, whoa, the world stopped and we all fell off. What the f*** is the matter with you? God did this. And then we think we're so smart because we found out about it. Ooh, I'm smart. I figured out science. No, God invented science and he let you learn. I mean, that's the truth. Mmm, it's not the truth in any demonstrable way. You're just saying it. I mean, we all know the universe behaves certain ways, and we can learn more about how it works and how we can most constructively live within it if we systematically explore it. And Kevin's attitude toward people who do systematically explore it, oh, I'm smart, I figured out science, is just moronic and foul. First off, no credible scientists think like this. They're in an ongoing, never-ending process of trying to learn more and more, so it's not like they think they know it all, and they'd laugh at the very phrase, figured out science. Second, this characterization of them running around saying, oh, I'm smart, casts people in the world as being full of empty arrogance and comes pretty close to explicitly stating that they don't believe in God because of empty arrogance. Now sure, some scientists are arrogant, but science itself methodically exploring the world and confining your conclusions to what you can demonstrate about it is a lot more humble than, oh, I don't know, 
barging into the conversation with no tangible qualifications whatsoever and making broad, unverified conclusions about the workings of the universe and the God who created it? I was talking to an atheist friend uh, this last week, and they were talking about how dumb I was. Um, no, this just isn't true. Nobody was talking about how dumb he was, and I know that because I was in the conversation. What happened was, I posted on Facebook the story of how Telltale's daughter recorded her teaching preaching in a public school classroom, and Kevin showed up and started making comments including that the preacher did nothing wrong and how it shouldn't be an issue anyway because they teach evolution in school even though that's a religion too. Because, of course, that's what turned the conversation toward evolution and the age of the earth. For Kevin to open up his story by saying we were talking about how dumb he was is frankly a flat lie. Because the stars are like millions and millions of light years away, and that's just stupid. The word stupid was never uttered. I even went back and checked. That he created the world 6,000 years ago or so, and that all the stars and stuff were made. He goes, because it, if that's the case, then the light wouldn't even be here yet. Right? Yeah, that's generally how things work. And then I did this really fun thing. I said, isn't that awesome that God did this on purpose? He created light before he created the planets and the stars and the sun and the moon. Yeah, he created the light first. Silence. Oh, Jiminy Christmas. Okay, so you've probably heard many times an apologist tell the story of how atheists were being big meanies, you know, calling him dumb and stuff, and he immediately shut them up with a single mic drop argument that left them speechless. And I'm sure you were rightly skeptical. Well, this is a rare situation where I actually know the real story behind the self-aggrandizing anecdote. Now, I will admit, technically his remark about God creating light before the stars was the last thing said at the time of this sermon, which means nobody had rebutted him by this point. So, I guess, if you lay out the timeline of the conversation, yeah. He made this remark and then there was silence. But that's just because, as in most social media interactions, there was a lot of back and forth, not all responses were immediate, and sometimes the person who gets the last word does so by being obnoxious until others drift out of the conversation. So while this doesn't get the pants on fire rating I'd assigned to the start of his tale, the I shut them up with my amazing argument vibe he's putting out here is uncharitable if not willfully deceptive. At any rate, this thing about how God created light before any light source, and that this pre-existing light fell into a path between later created stars and Earth is... not really something I would personally brag about having said. It's a prime example of creationism, far from predicting what we see in the universe, trying to shape a description of God's activities around whatever we already see. I said, so here's my theory. He created the light be between the star and the Earth before he put the star in place. Well, that's just dumb. The word dumb was also never uttered. Also, keep in mind that by this point, nobody had even replied to his remark about stars being created before light, so... Who was supposedly saying it was dumb? I'm sure that's not what he did. I'm sure that we have these ages of creation. You know, the first day was like a thousand years, or maybe ten thousand, or maybe a hundred thousand years. Second day was, you know, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. Nobody in the conversation said anything about the days of Genesis being varying lengths of time. I don't know why he thinks I try to make that point anyway when I'm an atheist. I'm like, you know, that's amazing. Wow, what a miracle. And they're like, whoa, what, what did I say? Now as you watch his portrayal of us standing there dumbfounded saying, whoa, what, what did I say? Remember that the entire conversation had ended at the point that he said, silence. So not only did we never have these reactions, but he's entirely making up both sides of a conversation he never had just to flex in front of his congregation. It's embarrassing to watch. God made the plant life before he made the sun. It's amazing that these trees and the grass and the leaves can survive without the sun for a thousand years. Wow. And I thought I knew science. Oh, what? What are you talking about? Again, just to keep logging these lines he's attributing to us, this baffled, oh, what? What are you talking about? is another one that's so completely made up that it's past the end of the conversation. Yeah, he created the sun after plant life. Now, isn't that a kicker? Well, maybe he made a mistake when he told us the order of the days. 
And now he has us shrugging and squeaking some pathetic retort about the order of the days in Genesis. Not only did nobody in the conversation ever say this, but it's irrelevant because I'd never make this argument because I don't need to explain the logic of how a thousand year day of creation would work because I think Genesis was made up to begin with. So Kevin just finished a totally invented dialogue in which I and my friend called him dumb, fell silent after getting pwned by nonsense about light existing before stars did, then found ourselves perpetually dumbfounded or desperate as we tried reconciling science with an alternative interpretation of a book we don't believe in and would feel no need to defend. I went into detail about this because too many pastors and apologists love these kinds of stories, and we've heard them over and over on my channel in responses to everybody from Mr. Butt to Frank Turek. We're suspicious of all of them, and I've often explained why I suspect their exaggerations or plain lies. But this was my first chance, as a participant in the anecdote, to rebut it in detail and show exactly what an obvious and deliberate lie it was. Hopefully this made pastors practice of thumping their chests in front of a congregation and portraying atheists as fumbling idiots just a little more transparent. Seriously people, there are so many things I could go on and on and on and on all day long. Well stop going on and on and on about how you could go on and on and on and actually present your arguments. And tell you about the beauty of the proof that God created this world a little over 6,000 years ago. Over and over I can show you this and it's undeniable. It's facts. Okay, so just to help us keep a sense of the flow of this thing, this is where he's finally, at long last, going to start sharing these arguments that he keeps telling us and telling us and telling us undeniably prove God. As he does, let's log exactly what argument he makes and how compelling it is. The earth is slowing down. It's been measured. Ooh, boy. This isn't what I think it is. Is it? Add about 1.6 billion years to the rotation of the earth. Speed it up. You're a bunch of blobs squished into the earth. Gravity pull would be so great, you'd be mush. You wouldn't be here. There would be no sustainable life. If you add the increase of the spin's rotation, if you add what's been taken away and you put 1.6 billion years to it, there's no possible way for life. What? I think this is the one about how the Earth's rotation is slowing so quickly that it couldn't be billions of years old. But this is so jumbled and inarticulate, I just have to assume that's what he means. I know the first point is saying the Earth is slowing down, but two and three seem to be saying something in very vague, unclear terms about adding or putting to 1.6 billion years to the rotation of the Earth or otherwise speeding its rotation. But two seems to say this would increase gravity and smash all the life on Earth, while three says it would fling us into space. So two of his points appear to contradict each other, but it's hard to tell because there's barely even any coherent syntax here. My friend Tony Reed, who plays the voice of God in my videos by the way, summed this argument up using actual coherent words in his episode of How Creationism Taught Me Real Science on this topic. So here's that for a little clarity. To disprove evolutionism, one need look no further than the rotation of the Earth. The Earth's rotation is slowing down at the rate of one one thousandth of a second per day. It's slowing down at a rate that scientists continuously add leap seconds to make up for the longer days. At this rate, one billion years ago, the spin would have been so fast that centrifugal force would have flattened it out like a pancake. There simply can't be enough time for the evolution and variety of living species on the planet. I had to investigate. There are a few obvious problems with this, and I'll refer back to some of Tony's clips to help explain. First off, we have no reason to think the Earth's rotation was always slowing at the rate it currently is and, for a variety of highly technical reasons, plenty of reason to think it's slowing more quickly now than before. I'll link a lot of information about this, provided by my friend Dave who was part of this conversation with Kevin, in the description. What's more, we have actual evidence that the Earth was only spinning a few hours slower 2.5 billion years ago. On February 15, 1997, George E. Williams published a paper in the journal Geophysical Research Letters. The paper continued his report on sedimentary cyclic rhythmites of tidal origin. As explained in Episode 6, these are essentially sandstone, siltstone, or mudstone deposits left by tidal forces and displaying various thicknesses. He discovered that the length of the day at 620 million years ago was 21.9 hours. At 900 million years ago, it was 20.9 hours. And at 2. 0.5 billion years ago, it was between 17.1 and 18.9 hours. 
But on top of all that, even granting it's always been slowing at its current rate, the Earth's spin still wouldn't be a problem. William Markowitz and R. Glenn Hall, two astronomers at the U.S. Naval Observatory, and Louis Essen and Jack Perry, two astronomers at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington, England, determined that the natural resonance frequency of the cesium atom was a near match to the standard second and would remain accurate to within one second every 1.4 million years. When applying this new standard for a second, the day totaled just over 86,400.002 seconds per day. Extrapolating back, the standard day would have been exactly 86,400 seconds in 1820, but had degraded at a rate of 1.4 milliseconds every century since. With this discrepancy, the difference between a standard year and a cesium standard year would differ by one second every couple years, and so the leap second was born. Although it is unlikely that the degradation rate of the Earth's rotation has ever been steady throughout history, at the current degradation rate of 1.4 milliseconds per century, even at 4.5 billion years ago, the the length of the average day would have been 6.5 hours. Now while a 6.5 hour day may sound dramatic, you'd barely notice the impact on perceived gravity. We know this not only mathematically, but through first-hand observation, as we experience more variation than that on Earth today depending on where we live. Way up here in Alaska, I'm spinning far slower than someone who lives on the equator. Yet somehow I'm not getting smashed, and nobody in South America or Africa is getting thrown off the Earth. In fact, if I went to the North Pole, where centrifugal force would do literally nothing to offset the gravitational pull on my body, I'd register less than a pound heavier than I would at the equator. This whole argument is nonsense from top to bottom in ways that any literate member of his congregation should be able to discover for themselves. And Kevin didn't even articulate it properly. Now to be clear, I'm not just making fun of him for stumbling over his words. But the fact that this did anything to satisfy his congregation indeed to serve as the opening in his salvo of undeniable arguments, says a lot about the dynamic we're looking at here. Kevin has trained his church to accept without question any suggestion, no matter how sloppy and unsighted, that there's evidence for God. And to be fair about rounding out the blame, this congregation has trained him to give it to them. By letting this amorphous verbal mush flow past their ears and assuming it meant anything, they were doing half his work for him. What's worse, They've trained him to think that anybody should sit there nodding blankly and saying amen in response to this. Which might explain why he gets so surprised and bent out of shape when atheists don't. Let alone the fact that the sun is getting smaller. We've measured it. It is actually a giant ball of burning gas. Pumbaa was right. It really is. And it's getting smaller because it's not replenishing its own gas. The idea of the sun just burning up its own gas is simplified to the point of being silly. It creates energy by fusing hydrogen into helium, which is then largely trapped by its own gravity. So while photons and heat escape, it retains more of its mass than you'd think if you're misunderstanding it as a ball of fire that's burning fuel. The lesson? Characters from The Lion King are not a good source of scientific knowledge. Though they'd probably tie with creationists in that regard. We know this is a fact. Add 1.6 billion. Let's add, I don't know, maybe it's 10.6. It might be 400 billion now. I don't know. They keep adding more billions in the newer textbooks because the, the bigger the no, number, the more complex and hard to grasp, the more believ believable it is. Or scientific estimates change as scientists learn more. But I bet that doesn't satisfy your hillbilly feeling of what them so-called experts are doing with your tax dollars. But I'm sorry, you add the 1.6 billion years to the size of the sun at the rate that it's shrinking, and we are so close, we'll be sucked into its gravitational pull. We don't exist today. That's a fact of science, people. First off, he's giving his congregation literally no data here other than add the 1.6 billion years to the size of the sun. So again, what they're letting pass for science is pretty depressing. But this one is easy to debunk as the creationist argument for this is based on a 1979 paper that upon peer review was found to be full of errors and was soon after disavowed by one of its primary authors. Yet creationism just smells a whiff of something it thinks validates its conclusion and incorporates it into a body of long-standing urban legends. The fact is, the sun doesn't shrink at nearly that speed and in fact goes through cycles of shrinking and expanding every 75 years. But what if we did assume it was constantly shrinking at its current rate? I'll let Tony do the math. Now break out your calculator. 
Although the rate isn't constant, if we assume the current rate of 43 million kilograms every second, times 60 seconds, times 60 minutes, times 24 hours, times 365 days, we arrive at a figure of 1.353 times 10 to the power of 17 kilograms every year. This seems like a big number, but if we multiply it by 5 billion years, we get 6.78 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. The sun's current mass is 1.989 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. What this means is, even if the rate of loss were 100 times greater, the sun would still only be a fraction of a percent less massive over 5 billion years. This would hardly have a dramatic effect on Earth's orbit. The question of mass is simple arithmetic, albeit with giant numbers. So yeah, this one's pretty sad. But believe it or not, it's not nearly as sad as what we're about to see next. Over and over, Niagara Falls is getting further back. Three feet a year, three to four feet on average, it's pushed back. That's scientific fact. You can measure it. Every year, go ahead, get your ruler, get it out there and measure this thing. And you, you say, well, what's the big deal? Well, how about we start adding three to four feet to Niagara Falls land that is being eroded every year. Let's start adding it and pushing it forward. I don't know, let's go a million years. There is no Niagara Falls. You can't do it. It doesn't work. Niagara Falls would be in the Gulf of Mexico at the rate that you're wanting to use. You're telling me this is an old earth? I have proof it's not. All right, so hear me out. Maybe Niagara Falls is younger than the earth. Seriously, this is the dumbest argument for anything I've ever heard, and I knew it was even when I was a teenager who believed in young earth creationism. I'm simply shocked there are people anywhere in the world willing to let this argument escape their mouth. You might as well look at a baby and deduce the earth can only be six months old. And I can go on and on and on. I'm not going to do that. Who cares if you could go on and on when all you've done so far is repeat three of the most basic, straight out of the box creationist talking points that have circulated churches for decades and are easily debunked by basic fact checking? I got to move on. Skip this next thought. Let's talk about the Bible. Socrates, Caesar, Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Herodotus, Euripides, Aristotle. I can go on with all these different names of historians that you will find in universities all across the land. Before telling us about how you can go on and on and on listing historians that are found in universities all across the land, whatever, you should at least make sure you can get through your first seven without including an emperor, a politician, philosophers, a name you got wrong, and a playwright. Is the bar for impressing his congregation really this low? They honor their works. They'll, they'll follow their writings. Universities honor the works of ancient authors and follow their writings? What the f*** is he talking about? Does he think universities are like church except they use books other than the Bible? They will tell you without any shadow of doubt that these are legit. This is their actual writings. But we don't have their original documents. you got to trust that this is true. This is, this is for sure their works. We know it's true. It's manuscripts. It's copies. But that's no big deal. We can trust it. This is nonsense. No serious academic has this kind of trust in ancient authors. They do their best to piece together an approximate, fluid picture of who the writers were and what might have been in the original versions of their works, keeping their conclusions tentative. Of course, we know the false comparison he's about to set up, but we'll let him get there himself. Well, what's the gap from, from when they wrote to where, where we are today with what we have in our hands? Oh, and it's not that much. It's only like a thousand years or so. You know, 1,500 years, we don't have their writings, but we have a copy, and, and yeah, it's 1,500 years later that this was written, but we, we're pretty sure it's accurate. We're pretty sure. You can trust it's true. 900 years, 1,550 years, 1,100 years. Time span from the writing to what we have in our hands today ranges from 1,000 to 1,700 years in gaps. 
Why does this matter? Because you will go to any university, any high school in this land, and they will tell you this is historical documented proof that the writings that we have are accurate and true to the original author. That's what they'll say. No, that's not what they'll say. Ever. Unless any of them are so flatly unqualified to work in academia that they share your fundamental misunderstandings of basic scholarship. Like I already explained, Historians are more careful than that with their findings, and there's a lot of academic legwork that goes into piecing together even the tentative the conclusions they reach. To represent them as taking manuscripts at face value with no surrounding contextual evidence no matter when in history they surfaced is a childish parody of how anything academic ever works. But the New Testament, oh no, no, no. New Testament, we can't trust that. It's been tampered with. Really? Well, some of these, I mean, really, we've got like seven copies of one of these guys. We've got ten copies of Caesar. I mean, Pliny the Younger, there's seven copies from his writings. You know, that's pretty good. Aristotle, 49. 49 copies. We're pretty sure this is accurate stuff. Jesus Christ. Can you just hurry up and get to the part where you tell us how many New Testament copies there are? How about the New Testament? Oh, it's, it's just a measly... 24,970 copies. Just, just actually, this is outdated. It's probably just a little over 26,000 copies. But you can't trust that. It's been tampered with. And there we have it. Of course, this has nothing whatsoever to do with how reliable the New Testament is. The vast majority of these copies were mass-produced in scriptorium centuries, indeed most of them more than a thousand years, after Christ. This is just the medieval version of printing. And all it proves is what we already know. That Christianity, as the most powerful political and social force in the West, had control over which documents were produced and preserved. That's it. If you're interested in hearing more about this, you can watch my old video, A Fistful of Manuscripts. Which, by the way, includes an unimportant but gross error that for some reason nobody's pointed out. Really, how many thousands of years between the original writing and what we have in our hands today? You know, so that all those wives' tales can be written in? I didn't get much laughter out of that. Then tell better jokes. All, all those goofy men making up stories. Let's go with that one. That's not much laughter either, considering you had to ask for it. Right? It's been tampered with. It's been messed with. It's not really what it was originally written as. Oh, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, there's a gap of 25 years. No. No, 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 no. I will not let him get away with this. He previously, in vague generalized terms, I'll add, brought up the gap between authors and surviving copies of their texts. But here he's bringing up not the oldest surviving copy of Paul's work, but the estimated date it was written. This is comparing two totally different things. There are no surviving copies of Paul's writings from 25 years after Christ, and the oldest surviving New Testament document is a tiny scrap of the book of John that stayed between 125 and 175, with recent estimates placing it closer to the year 200. So this is a dishonest or at least totally fumbled comparison. What's more, the attention the dominant Christian church gave to preserving texts that consider holy probably has a lot to do with why so many of these otherwise irrelevant texts survived while non-biblical manuscripts fell by the wayside. Kevin goes on, but it gets pretty long-winded, so I'm going to skip a bit. And in the end, all these arguments are irrelevant for one basic reason, which is the conclusions they're trying to draw about Jesus. As I'd said before, academics don't claim to know exactly what Caesar wrote in his original writings. They certainly don't claim to know exactly what he said or did at any particular time. These are conclusions we can never reach about him or anybody else in the ancient past, and no amount of historical corroboration would make historians think Caesar did actual miracles or be so confident in the authority of the words attributed to him that they would focus their lives on his teachings. That's because it would take a huge leap to get from even the most solid historical documentation to these kinds of conclusions. So when Christians draw these conclusions about Jesus, they're taking the same huge leap to justify beliefs they already held. But Kevin muddies the waters by exaggerating the faith historians have in ancient authors so he can imply they're being inconsistent if they don't draw these same insane conclusions about the Bible. And of course they're only this inconsistent because, you know, the evidence for God is obvious yet they want to ignore it. Now all he needs to drive this point home is, oh, I don't know, a story that models exactly what any honest non-believer should do the moment they hear this amazing evidence. 
So let's fast forward to that. So many things, and I could go on, but here's the bottom line. God has chosen the foolishness of this world to discourage and totally mess up the wise. And when the wise start to dig, like Josh McDowell did many years ago, a professing atheist. Ugh. Professing atheist Josh McDowell. I'm pretty darn sure we know where this is going. His friends, his Christian friends, loved him enough to say, you know what, we get you. We still want to be friends, but how about you do this for us? Why don't you prove to us that he isn't who he said he is? We've been trying to convince you, and you have every argument to deny. How about you go ahead and prove to us that we're believing a lie? He goes, okay, I'll take that challenge. I'll do that, and you, and you know the story. He ends up being one of the greatest apologetic teachers and preachers our century has ever seen. Defending the gospel of Jesus Christ as truth. Because what he found out was it's undeniable. It is absolute foolishness to not believe when there's so much evidence to the contrary. And there's a story in all its formulaic glory. Josh McDowell was a hardened atheist, but the moment he investigated the evidence, it became obvious there was no honest choice but to believe. These anecdotes and the obsession Christians have with repeating them are a pesky thorn in the side of communication between atheists and Christians. They're cliched, often implausible-sounding tools used to set believers' expectations of what should happen every time an atheist hears a basic apologetic. While maybe not assuming their lies, we should be very leery of a personal backstory that's used to market books and speaking engagements, especially if it provides weirdly neat, easy validation for the cause they're advocating for and, frankly, making money off of. The fact is, few if any informed atheists are going to be blown away by the cosmological argument or the 500 eyewitnesses thing, and most will actually be very familiar with them and know their shortcomings inside and out. And in general, any discussion between people of different or no faiths is going to be long and complicated and will rarely end in minds being quickly changed. But these tales reinforce the more comforting but very unrealistic expectation that any atheist will immediately fold the moment you tell him basically any argument for God you heard over the pulpit. Now, you might argue, maybe that's not Kevin's intention. I mean, it seems obvious from context, and I can't see any other reason why he'd bother telling this story. But to give him the benefit of the doubt, Let's see if he actually, oh, I don't know, explicitly makes this very point. He is Christ, Messiah, King of kings and Lord of lords. And every person that I know as an atheist that dove in to prove that he's not true has found it to be that he is. Worldly perception causes our lens to be distorted, and we cannot see truth when it's right in front of us. So here it is in plain words. Every atheist he knows who dove into the topic ended up discovering that God is real. So what do you think this does to conversations between Christians and atheists? What happens when we don't act out this fantasy of atheists being immediately perplexed by prepackaged freshman-level apologetics? They're probably going to experience a lot of surprise, and frustration when we actually push back against arguments that supposedly knock Josh McDowell straight on his ass. And there's a good chance they'll process the experience by assuming we're stubborn, sinful, or experiencing a worldly perception that keeps us from seeing what's right in front of us. In short, as he's done throughout this sermon, Kevin's conditioning his congregation to react poorly and assume the worst of any atheist who doesn't immediately convert. And he's not the only one because this narrative is pervasive throughout Christianity and pretty reasonably backed up by the Bible. This brings us to Kevin's dramatic finale, which involves some kind of desert toad that proves how impossible evolution is. And since this is the big knock-it-out-of-the-park moment that he's been building up to, I've asked Jackson Wheat, a great science communicator working on his master's in biology, to dismantle Kevin's argument in more detail than I ever could. Enjoy! And if you like what you're seeing here, please go subscribe to Jackson. He has a channel with very entertaining, informative videos for anybody interested in biology or evolution. I learned this back in 1991. There's a toad called a desert toad. I think it lives in Arizona, Utah, and those regions. And it has the strangest way of reproducing. And I won't get too graphic with you because that'd just be silly. But here's the deal. 
The male toad is smaller than the female toad. That's just the way it is for those particular toads. Maybe all toads are that way. But the male toad, when it's time to mate, he gets on top of the female toad. Literally sitting on top of her, and he excretes a solution. And the female toad, miraculously, grows a sac around that to protect it so it won't dry out in the hot desert sun. It literally creates those bumps that you see on toads to protect it. And in that, you know, that safe environment, the fluids interact and the conception takes place. On top of the skin of a toad in a desert where it's dry and would evaporate in hours if the protection wasn't there. And after those little things that have become living beings gets big enough, they literally burst out of those sacks into this world and you have lots of little toads. Hello everyone, it's an honor to be here. This pastor has some pretty grave misconceptions of how evolution works, which probably isn't too surprising for a creationist, and he gives an example of something he thinks refutes evolution, which, well, doesn't. So, let's jump right in. Before we get into the specifics of the pastor's claims, let's look at what type of argument, if we're being generous, he's putting forth. This type of argument is what my friend and co-author of The Rocks Were There, R.J. Downard, calls a gee whiz argument. It goes like this. Organism or biological structure X is very complicated or weird, therefore evolution is false and or therefore God. Richard Dawkins parodies this argument style in his book Science and the Soul, saying, quote, 1. The eye, the articulation of the mammalian jaw, the bacterial flagellum, the elbow joint of the lesser spotted weasel frog, which you have never heard of and don't have time to look up before you seem to a lay audience to have lost the argument, is irreducibly complex. 2. Therefore, it cannot have evolved by gradual degrees. 3. Therefore, it must have been designed. Close quote. Of course, there's no evidence of any intelligent design in nature. This charge is always merely asserted. Now, I had never heard of this example, so I attempted to look it up, and I don't think this frog, as he describes it, exists. When I searched Desert Toad from Arizona on Google, the first result for me was the Colorado River Toad, which evidently doesn't have the behavior the pastor describes. The Colorado River toad lays its eggs in temporary pools formed by monsoon rains, so clearly he wasn't referencing that one. I also found that the Colorado River toad co-occurs with several other toads. The Spadefoot toad, the Great Plains toad, the Red Spotted toad, and Woodhouse's toad. From what I can tell, none of these toads exhibit the behavior described either. Maybe the toad described by the pastor exists, but he gives so little information that I don't know what he's referring to. I even put the question to Twitter, but no one seemed to have any information. But further, I don't think this toad exists because the act of reproduction that he's describing doesn't work. Like it physically wouldn't work. The pastor says the male toad secretes his sperm onto the female's back, and the female toad forms pockets on her back to catch and hold the sperm. In those pockets, the pastor says, quote, the fluids interact and conception takes place, close quote. Now, I assume he's describing conception that way because he's thinking about how to explain sex with kids in the audience, but this is confusing to me. In sex, a sperm cell fertilizes an egg cell and their union forms a zygote. But where does the egg come from? The egg comes from the female's ovary, and the only way the egg can leave the female's body is through her cloaca, which serves as the sole exit for her digestive, urinary, and reproductive tracts. So something's gone wrong about his argument. With that in mind, how would the eggs get on, or rather in, the, the back? The eggs can't just migrate from her ovaries to her back waiting to be fertilized. That doesn't physiologically work. And I'm not aware of any frogs or toads who have so radically reconstructed their reproductive tract that it now ends on the back rather than in the cloaca. The story doesn't make any sense. It's possible he's misremembering something he once heard. Given that he said he heard about this toad in 1991, that wouldn't surprise me. It makes you wonder, though, how could such a simple story be changed so much in such a short period of time? It's only been a mere 30 years. Hmm. Anyway, back to those migrating frogs' eggs. There are frogs and toads, collectively called anurans, 
who house the zygotes on their back until they hatch, including the serenum toad, Pipa Pipa, the horned marsupial frog, Gastrotheca, and horned tree frogs of the genus Hemifractus. Anurans exhibit a wide variety of reproductive strategies. The preacher, or whatever sources he may or may not have relied on, may not like it, but it's a fact of frog nature that many fertilize their eggs externally, in which males and females secrete their gametes into the surrounding water. Free-living tadpoles then often hatch from these eggs and later develop into their adult forms. Some anurans fertilize their eggs internally and give birth to live young, as has been observed in Nimbophrenoides occidentalis. Some anurans even lay their eggs in leaves suspended above a body of water, as in Philomedusa, while others carry their tadpoles around after they hatch, like Colostethus panamensis. In fact, a 2003 summary identified 10 distinct types of parental care in anurans. Even within these types, there is a huge variety of different ways that anurans go about performing parental care. Today, though, we're interested in frogs who carry their developing offspring on their back. Of course, there are a variety of ways in which this is accomplished. For example, the hemifractus male simply scoops the zygotes onto the female's back where they adhere to her. However, she excretes them underwater. The eggs have to be kept from drying out. How would this work in a desert setting, though? It is worth noting that many of the inurin species who exhibit parental care have terrestrial or semi-terrestrial modes of life. Going further, the serenum toad Pipa Pipa has an even stranger mode of reproduction. Like other externally fertilizing anurans, the female secretes her eggs into the water, and the male fertilizes them, and, like in Hemifractus, the male helps scoop the eggs onto the female's back. This time, however, hormones cause the female to grow more skin on her back after egg implantation, thus the eggs become buried under her skin. When the eggs hatch, baby frogs, not tadpoles, burst forth from the mother's back and go on their free-living way. Another frog that holds on to its eggs is the horned marsupial frog, Gastrotheca, which has a dorsal pouch for catching the eggs. In all three of these cases, the anurans have adapted their hormones and or partitioned their epidermis in particular ways, neither of which are especially surprising. There is a revealing twist to the story of Gastrotheca regarding how animals are related. Both Hemifractus and Gastrotheca are in the family Hemifractidae. Evidently, possessing a free-living tadpole stage was lost early on in this family's evolutionary history, and they switched to giving birth to froglets. However, making eggs that hatch into tadpoles was regained in some species of Gastrotheca. Now, to get back to the pastor, I don't think the toad he's describing exists, but I could be wrong. If I am, can someone please let me know? I'd love to read about this toad. Bet it has a really interesting evolutionary history, if so. But... Let's get back to the video. There you go, Biology 101. I didn't get too detailed, I hope. But let me ask you this question if you're an evolutionist. How did that evolve? How did that evolve? Well, you know, they were thinking one day, I need to reproduce. Therefore, I shall make my skin create a sack of fluid when the male toad is on top of my back in just the right amount of time so that whatever's coming out of him is protected with the fluid from my skin and then that's how we're going to reproduce. I think that's what I'll do. As I said before, I don't think this frog exists, so his question about its evolution is moot. However, his caricature of evolution should be addressed as it's completely wrong. It's common for creationists to think of evolution as a process in which an organism decides it needs some feature, but this is precisely the opposite of how evolution actually works. Briefly, every individual is born with genetic variations. These are often minor variations. These variations are then subjected to selective pressures from the environment, such as predators, prey, climatic conditions, mates, etc., to give an illustration, one which seems fairly relevant here, imagine a population of frogs that vary in their skin color. Some frogs are born brightly colored, while others are born darkly colored. If in this environment being born brightly colored means you are highly visible, then on average, only the brightly colored frogs are going to be, say, seen and eaten by hawks. Over generations, every brightly colored frog is going to be eliminated, and only darkly colored frogs are going to be able to reproduce. Thus, the allele 
for bright skin color is going to be lost unless some series of events occurs in which it becomes favorable to have the bright skin again. This is how natural selection works. Or if we want to apply this to, say, the horned marsupial frog Gastrotheca mentioned earlier, then its evolution may have occurred like this. Gastrotheca already occurs in a family in which the members adhere the eggs to their back. Gastrotheca simply takes this one step further by invaginating its skin to form a dorsal sac. The frog didn't consciously do any of this, but each generation had mutations which slightly invaginated the skin more. By having a deeper dorsal sac, the frog could protect more eggs at a time. This is a possible selective pressure that could have favored the deepening of the sac. So, it's a matter of incremental mutations accumulating over time. No conscious thought involved. What? Wait, what? You're telling me that a toad spontaneously, some just miraculously, boom, immediately upon its evolution into the toadness of a toad, how it got there we don't know, but it's suddenly a toad, and then it says, oh, we have to reproduce too. I mean, toads only live, what, nine months? A year? Three months? I have no idea how long a toad lives. I'm sorry. First, toads in captivity have been known to live up to 30 years, but that's not really germane to the argument. Again, his argument is that he doesn't understand how evolution works. He thinks that the dorsal incubation sac of the alleged desert toad would have formed instantly, but even if the toad did exist, then its sac wouldn't have formed instantly. In creationism, things can happen instantaneously because God can do whatever he or she or it or they want. Things don't happen that way in evolution. In evolution, features evolve over many generations, not all in one go. The pastor also says people don't know how toads came to be, but that isn't correct either. Enuran ancestors like Triadobatrachus date to the early Triassic and look quite a bit more like salamanders than modern Enurans. Given what we know about amphibian evolution, this isn't super surprising. But the Enuran body plan was formed in the Triassic or Jurassic, which was long before the modern Enurans evolved. Ancestral Enurans also, of course, already had a reproductive style, which was probably the external fertilization system that most modern Enurans have. Once again, we have encountered a religious claim about evolution, which depended not on there being no evidence, but of their being unaware of it. It is absolutely impossible to evolve into a reproduction state that this toad does. It had to be created that way. There is no answer to that. And this is one of a hundred examples. It is interesting, but not surprising, that the pastor's argument is... My ridiculous caricature of evolution destroys evolution. I'm sure he simply doesn't know enough about evolution to understand that he has made a caricature, but he's on stage acting like an authority on the subject. I also want to point out that even within creationism, I think most professional creationists would reject his argument. Creationists tend to equate the created kind or barrowman with the family level in modern taxonomy, but this pastor is arguing that a single species must have been a created event. I wonder if he accepts speciation at all. If not, he's bucking the trend of modern creationist baromenology. In closing, I'm curious to know if the pastor has a hundred other examples of non-existent organisms that he asserts couldn't have evolved. Maybe that's a topic he'll explore in another sermon. At any rate, thanks for having me, Zod. I'll see you all next time. And thank you, Jackson, for that great explanation. What amazes me is that Kevin, claiming to have any scientific interest or aptitude whatsoever, relies on some super vague thing he heard about some toad back in 1991. Like Jackson said, this toad probably doesn't exist, but it's hard to say because Kevin doesn't even identify it. He just heard something about this unnamed Rita toad 30 f***ing years ago. And this is what he thinks there's no answer to. It's just plain embarrassing. Every argument I've ever had, or debate, if you will, with someone who has claimed to be wise but doesn't believe in God, it has turned into a foolishness of discussion. I will definitely agree with that. I'm just not sure Kevin's in tune with the nature of the foolishness or who it came from. Because the facts don't work for them. They really don't. 
I do it with the best of my ability to say these things with love and patience and kindness, but there is a, a ne necessary need to express truth. And the truth of God frazzles and completely uh, messes with the wise of this world every time. So I'm going to cut Kevin off there. Basically, everything in his sermon, from his insistence that evidence for God is obvious, to his trash talk about me and my friend Dave, to his obligatory exercise in rattling off a few basic apologetics, is meant to, or at the very least does, teach his congregation to misunderstand confrontations with atheists. And what he just said here shows that he experiences the same misunderstanding he's trying to engender in his congregation. I'm going to sum up in closing by reading my final thoughts from the Facebook conversation. The problem, at least as I can see it, is that he comes to us thinking basic prepackaged apologetics have settled the issue entirely, and that the only reason we're not blown away by them is that we hate the cross or love darkness or want to sin or whatever. Dust jacket testimonials of people like Lee Strobel and Josh McDowell have set his expectations of how any sincere non-believer would instantly respond to these apologetics, and his scripture has painted an unflattering picture of what our attitudes must be when we don't. Then he reads any friction he feels in this conversation as a product of us being frustrated because we're confronted by obvious biblical truth we don't want to acknowledge, and he runs back to his congregation and characterizes this conversation accordingly. Now this might all seem pretty dire. It might just seem like I'm belaboring the hopelessness of trying to converse with Christians poisoned by radicalized rhetoric. But to speak to that, I'll share the rest of my post, addressed to my friend Dave, who knows more about science than I do, and had led the way in countering Kevin's creationist claims. But as daunting as this feels, you are making a difference. People will see what you're saying, and the nuance of the information how it belies YEC arguments will slowly sink in, as it did for me. It won't instantly or even ever reverse their opinion entirely, and I'm fine if it doesn't, but hopefully it will help them see things in a slightly new light and at least understand non-believers and evolutionists a little better. This also gives us a chance to shine light on the divisive rhetorical strategies of radicalized clergy, and I plan on using his recent sermon to illustrate the very point. And I guess that brings us to where we are now. So there is hope. We can reach people, even if not all of them, even if not quickly. It just takes time and patience. Hopefully my analysis of Kevin's sermon will help you see the baggage many Christians bring to conversations they have with you, and hopefully you can take something from my response that will be of use. This program was made possible by a grant from John Adams, Bob Generic, Maggie Danger, A Little Logic, S.R. Foxley, The Crowd Pleaser, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.